Fox and host Joe Malentrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. We've been coming to you live from the Digital Asset Summit in New York City. Joining me for the segment of Michael Morrow. He is the CEO of Genesis Global Trading. We're going to focus on cryptocurrency lending and borrowing. Michael, it's great to have you with us on set. How does crypto lending and borrowing work? Who would participate? So we have obviously two sides of the transaction. There are folks who are lending cryptocurrency to Genesis. Those would be the crypto whales, the largest buyers that were probably bought in 2011, 2012, 2013, who are now looking to earn some yield, make Bitcoin and Ethereum more of a, a productive asset to them. So they lend to Genesis and we pay them in interest every single month in Bitcoin or Ethereum, whatever it is that they've lent to us. We turn around and lend that out to institutions be hedge funds, family offices, as well as sort of crypto OTC market makers, right. and folks trying to take advantage of the potential arbitrage opportunities. Right, because there's a very limited amount of cryptocurrency that's available to us. I think stock where you can just issue fresh capital and that's time to get. That's correct. So liquidity is a huge right. factor of the interest rate mm -hmm. that carried that the loans ultimately kind of carry. Bitcoin, the most liquid, easiest to borrow. It'll be like a large cap stock equivalent. Whereas the lower you get on the market cap table, the more illiquid it becomes, it's harder to locate, but larger interest rates. So it's just like stock shorting. Absolutely. All right, what are the volumes like and um, what's being borrowed? So the volumes are currently about, for Genesis, it's about half a billion a quarter. Mm -hmm. So that number, but this business we launched in March of last year, so it's still relatively new. Yeah. So the amount, the fact that we've lent nearly two billion in assets during that 15 months, it's exceeded my personal expectations as to what the market can potentially borrow. However, the biggest interest, obviously Bitcoin, about two thirds of our portfolio is Bitcoin. So we have about $400 million of loans outstanding today, roughly two thirds of that is Bitcoin. And the rest is really a combination of Ether, Litecoin, XRP, some of the biggest sort of high market capitalization companies. Now, why would the institution want to So, the primary is uh, for Ether, Litecoin, obviously a speculative short. Mm -hmm. Now, whether they're naked short or they've hedged a different position, they're long elsewhere and looking to take a, some money off the table, uh, take a, a hedging bet on the short side, we don't really have that view into kind of ultimately what they're doing. But for some of those non-Bitcoin uh, speculation on downward price prediction, is their number one use case. Bitcoin is different. There's lots of companies in the cryptocurrency space that have Bitcoin actually as their working capital. And so they actually get a loan in Bitcoin to almost fund their business. It's almost like a business loan or a commercial loan as opposed to say, hey, I'm going to take a short bet on Bitcoin. Almost no one is currently shorting Bitcoin. So over the past few weeks, we've seen that massive run in Bitcoin. That means they actually have more capital to work with. That's 100% correct. Because of our loan book is actually denominated in crypto, as the price runs up, naturally our loan book naturally expands. Um, and so that's been a nice boost for us in the last few weeks. All right. Now, how will this market continue to evolve? So ultimately, I think the, um, and you sort of mentioned sec lending earlier, sort of equities borrowing, my sense that it ultimately kind of evolves at that level, where folks are able to go long or go short and have that be a natural thing that exists in cryptocurrency. It's still very new, still very clunky, so the infrastructure ultimately kind of needs to keep up, but institutional investors need to be able to go both ways on, on Bitcoin, Ether, like whatever it is at any given time. So hopefully we kind of catch up to that point where it's perfectly natural to take a long position or a short bet in a much more liquid market in the spot market than the futures market. I'm really glad that you brought that up there. It just naturally takes time. I think there was participation where they were thinking it to be a natural plug and play, just like equity market structure, for example, but that has taken decades to evolve. It has. It's not going to happen within a year, two years, it might even take five, ten years until you see that natural liquidity evolve. And I'm really glad you brought that up because it's just not going to happen overnight. It's a different kind of asset class. I'm glad you brought that up because I think we tend to pick on cryptocurrency as being so nascent, so yeah. new, and it's missing A, missing B, missing C, rather than appreciating just how far we've come, just in a short period of time. We started trading cryptocurrencies in 2013. The idea that the CME futures product would exist was a pipe dream sort of back then. So the fact that more institutions are certainly getting in, more infrastructure will get built, and I guarantee you it'll get built out much, much faster than it took in the equities and the fixed income market. I agree. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us. Thanks for and thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malentrino, Global Market Reporter at NASDAQ.